present Good News of 1939. Makers of Maxwell House Coffee welcome you to another hour of entertainment brought to you by Metro Golden Mayor Studios in Hollywood. With Frank Morgan, Fanny Bryce, Rita Johnson, Hanley Stafford, Connie Boswell, Meredith Wilson, and his orchestra, and tonight's guest of honor, the world famous newspaper columnist of the Chicago Tribune Syndicate, Ed Sullivan. Your host for this hour of entertainment is Robert Young, who will shortly join Meredith Wilson in a new song called I've Got a Pebble in My Shoe. <laughs> A boat is driving like a cork in the ocean, and it's a grooving like perpetual motion. There's a reason I can stand, I want to do a handstand. Got a pebble in the shoe body, I ouch. Got a pebble in the shoe body, I ouch. Only thing that I can do, who do you do? I gotta keep dancing all the time. I gotta keep on dancing tonight. How'd it ever get in my little toesy? Never thought a pebble could be so nosy. Gotta shag it out of my little hosey. I gotta keep dancing all the time. I gotta keep on dancing tonight. Now it's going to my heel. Maybe you can box the field. Now it's turning like the wind. Where's it gonna go now? Got a pebble in my shoe body, I ouch. Got a pebble in my shoe body, I ouch. Only thing that I can do, boo do you do? I gotta keep dancing all the time. Let's get down to business. One evening about 10 years ago, a newspaper writer created a column, Water Under the Bridge. In it, he put interesting facts about people he had known, people once famous and later obscure. The column made a tremendous hit, and tonight its creator will present Water Under the Bridge for the first time on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, Ed Sullivan. Thank you, Bob. Suppose we turn back the calendar 10 years. June 4th, 1929, New York City. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. and Joan Crawford were married today at St. Malachy Church. New London, Connecticut. Colonel Charles Lindbergh and Ann Morrow embarked on their honeymoon on Long Island Sound. Los Angeles. Jack Dempsey and Estelle Taylor denied divorce rumors. New York. National League baseball batting averages relieve, reveal Lefty O'Doul of the Phillies leading the league with an average of 422. In the American League, Jimmy Fox leading with 424. On November 29th, Commander Richard E. Byrd with Bernd Balchon as pilot reached the South Pole at about 8.55 a.m. Turning to the motion picture advertisements of the New York Daily News, we find all theaters announcing proudly the current attractions are talking pictures. Los Angeles, a new radio act. Three sisters from New Orleans made their debut on the air that night. The Boswell sisters. Tonight, Connie Boswell, a great star in her own right since the retirement of her sisters, sings my friend Nick Kenny's Little Skipper. <laughs> Baby Clipper, what 
don't you sail too far away at the foot of your bed is your faithful little food it's your own puppy dog keeping watch the whole night Lovely, Connie. Thank you very much. Bob, there's another great star on your program I admire very much. You mean uh, Fanny Bright? No, I'll come to her later. I'm talking about Frank Morgan. I've never met him. Well, that's easy to fix. Frank's just come in from a quick trip to New York. He's talking to the reporters. Say, uh, Frank. Uh, I'll be right with you, Bob. Uh, I just, just a minute, Mr. Morgan. I want yes, to ask uh, you. That's all right. The farm situation can be summed up in a nutshell. The farms are for farming. Gee, that's hot. Let me get that straight. Well, I'll put it another way. Under modern marketing conditions, if the farmer is to survive, he must stop the crop, oil the soil, and rototote the potato. <laughs> Frank! Well, that's all, son. Now get back to your paper. Hey, just one more question, Mr. Morgan. No, 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 no. Now good. that's all. Now, no, no. Good day. <laughs> Well, Bob, it's a pleasure to see you again. Those reporters have been in my hair ever since I stepped out of the plane. How was your trip back, Mr. Morgan? Oh, fine, except for these pests. Why is it, I wonder, that as soon as a man is hired by a newspaper, he instantly becomes obnoxious? I never found an exception, and I must say... Uh, that Frank, if I have... Frank, what? Uh, before you put your foot into it any farther, this fellow you're talking to sells more newspapers than... Sells newspapers? Fa- the Chicago Tribune, Philadelphia Ledger, Denver Post... Well, give me a Hollywood Citizen News. Say... say <laughs> Tell me, son, how do you lads stand between the cars at the intersections without getting your brains knocked out? Wait a minute, Fat. What? <laughs> this gentleman's not a newsboy. He's the foremost newspaper columnist in America. Oh, well, I'm terribly sorry. Please accept my apologies, Mr. Fiddler. <laughs> Frank! <laughs> Help? Hollering. <laughs> Let me straighten this out, Bob. Mr. Morgan, my name is Ed Sullivan. I write a column for the Chicago Tribune Syndicate. Oh, sure, Mr. Syndicate. I've read your column many times. Uh, Frank, what's the matter with you? I never saw you act this way before. Well, I don't know. I've been a little confused since my plane trip. My head is still buzzing. Were you bothered by the engine? Well, we stopped at Albuquerque, and they tried to send me a blanket, but I... Oh, you mean the motors! (laughs) <laughs> well, well, Sullivan, are you glad you met Morgan? I want to get out of here. Now, don't go, young man. I hope I didn't say anything to offend you or newspaper men in general. Believe me, my boy, yours is a wonderful graph. 
I meant crap. <laughs> I can feel it coming. Mr. Morgan, don't tell me that you're an old newspaper man yourself. Well, I've had some little experience as a journalist, but I'd never tell a famous columnist like yourself about it. Now, I... wait a minute, Frank. You once handed me a line of guff about your journalistic career. Let's see if you can make it stick with Mr. Sullivan. You're acting very forward, young, for such a backward fellow. <laughs> well, I've been on papers all over the country, Frank. What paper were you on? Uh, what uh, on? Yeah. Uh, tell me, Mr. Sullivan, did you ever work on the old New York world in the days of its prime? Yes, sir. Uh, oh. <laughs> That was a fine paper. <laughs> well, you should have worked on the old Louisville Courier in the days of old... Morris Henry Watterson. I yes. was there. Uh, you were there. Well, Watterson. Uh, <laughs> Newspapers, Tribune, Times, American Herald. <laughs> Herald! Mr. Sullivan, did you ever work on the old New York Herald <laughs> under James Gordon Bennett? No. Ah, oh, there was a newspaper. <laughs> in those days, reporters were artists, and they lived like kings. I suppose you covered fires in a full-dress suit. Only if the alarm rang after 6 o'clock. <laughs> I, I was the Lucius Phoebe of my day, but I seldom stooped to conflagrations. I was known as Foul Ball Morgan, the dean of the sports riders. Dizzy or Daffy? <laughs> Sullivan, is it true your paper pays $2 for quips like that? If they're not too much like that. Huh. Let's hear some more of the sports stuff, Frank. I used to dabble in sports a bit. Oh, you dabbled in that, too. Well, <laughs> you used to get around a bit, I mean, before you were a columnist, didn't you? Never mind that foul ball. Just keep pitching. <laughs> well, I got my first big opportunity on account of a story I wrote about a baseball game. Mm. Mr. Sullivan, as a craftsman in words, you can appreciate it when I tell you this whole adventure hinged on a single sentence. I was sent up to Sing Sing Prison. What was the sentence? And I 30 days. I, d I didn't mean to say that. Go on, Frank. Well, I was sent up to Sing Sing to cover a prison ball game. And honestly, I wish you could have seen the story I wrote that day. It was a classic. I covered every detail of the convict's play, but unfortunately, I left out just one little thing. What did you leave out, Frank? Well, there was the prison break in the fifth inning and four or five hundred... Oh, from that colossal blunder, you got your first opportunity. Well, indirectly. My great adventure was soon to come. Mr. Sullivan, I'll tell you a story of journalistic enterprise that'll chill the blood of any man that ever peeped through a keyhole. And I do mean you. <laughs> Big story, huh, Frank? Well, I should have won the Pulitzer Prize. Just the first two letters. P-U. <laughs> yes, well, I can't, there's no... It was Christmas <laughs> Eve in the Herald office, and as usual at that time, all of the reporters and editors had gone home. I happened to be there alone trying to finish my Christmas dog column when suddenly the phone rang. I was instantly galvanized into action. I said, hello? Hello? Who's this? Bob Young. Get off the wire. <laughs> <laughs> A voice at the other end informed me that the madcap daughter of the nation's most powerful senator had just eloped with a streetcar conductor by the name of Rob Nichols. That's a $2 one, Morgan. <laughs> you were all alone, Frank. What did you do? Well, I dashed out of the senator's mansion. It was on Mansion Street. Checked the story, kissed the maid, and rushed back to the office. I arrived with the biggest scoop in years, and what do you think? What? No printers. No printers? Yes, they'd all gone home. It was time for a quick decision, and I knew my editor would promote me for it. I dashed to the composing room, wrote my story in type, and set a headline over it in 88-point gothic, upper and lower case. What size cap? Six and seven eight. <laughs> what am I talking about? <laughs> I ripped out a dull war story from the front page, replaced it with my scoop and started the presses rolling. The sweat poured from my face as I ripped the finished copies from the rollers a thousand at a time. Single-handed? Yes, sir. And not only that, but I folded them, bundled them, wired them, dumped them, and sold a million copies myself before 2 a.m. Say, it must have been a great story. It was. It had romance and drama. Here was a wealthy girl, a senator's daughter, so much in love with a poor young fellow that she elopes with him, disguised in her father's clothes. Probably gave her a raise for that. Well, well, I did no, they fired me because they didn't like the headline I wrote. What was the headline, Frank? Fleas in Senator's Pants. <laughs> well, so long, fellas. <laughs> All right, I'm going to steal a little of Ed Sullivan's stuff and presenting Meredith Wilson's next number. It's pretty well agreed that Cole Porter is the most sophisticated popular songwriter in America. 
He's on the Metro lot now, writing the score for the forthcoming production, Broadway Melody, which will star Fred Astaire and Eleanor Powell. Everybody knows the Cole Porter of today, but I'm sure that some of you will be surprised when Meredith plays the first hit song he ever wrote. It was published in 1919, and it's called Old Fashioned Garden. <laughs> Everyone who loves a good cup of coffee. And I guess that's just about everybody. Right you are, Bob. You know, good news travels fast. And on every hand, you hear more and more comments like this about the new Maxwell House coffee. I want to tell you the coffee is always good at our house. Every cup my wife serves is just as perfect and delicious as the one before. And then that's simply because of the absolute uniformity of freshness and roasting that the Maxwell House people give us. I know that no matter when I buy a can of Maxwell House coffee... I'm getting just about the finest coffee I can get, and always the same full flavor. And let me add, a man certainly appreciates the grand flavor and body of a coffee like Maxwell House. Once in a while, I do the family shopping myself, and I'm always surprised at the wonderful value this coffee offers at such a fair price. Statements like these from loyal Maxwell House users show you why more people are enjoying Maxwell House coffee today than ever before. Friends... You see, ordinary methods of packing coffee allow air to come in and steal away coffee flavor. All coffee, if exposed to the air, starts to lose flavor as soon as it's roasted. In fact, ground coffee packed in ordinary containers where air can get at it 
loses as much as 45%, nearly half, in only nine days. But with Maxwell House, the coffee is taken still fresh and fragrant from the roasting oven and packed in the airtight super vacuum can. No air can get in, so no flavor can get out. All the rich fragrance and flavor of these superb coffees is sealed in. The vacuum can brings roaster freshness right into your kitchen. So won't you try a pound of the new Maxwell House? Ask your grocer for the familiar blue super vacuum can. You'll be delighted with the extra richness of this marvelously improved coffee. You'll see at once that you're getting coffee not just days fresh, but roaster fresh. No coffee can be fresher than that. Here's Ed Sullivan again, ladies and gentlemen, with more water under the bridge. Let's rip 18 years from the calendar. 1921, Washington, D.C. President Warren G. Harding and Vice President Calvin Coolidge inaugurated. Charles Evans Hughes appointed Secretary of State. Andrew W. Mellon appointed Secretary of the Treasury. Will Hayes appointed Postmaster General. Forest Hill. Big Bill Tilden and Little Bill Johnston won the Davis Cup Final for America against Japan. Boston. Babe Ruth of the New York Yankees hits his 51st home run of the season. And moving pictures of 1921, Wallace Reed and the Hell Diggers, Mary Pickford in Pollyanna, Thomas Meehan in Conquest of Canaan, Gloria Swanson in The Great Moment, Douglas Fairbanks and the Three Musketeers. Broadway. At the Globe Theater just 18 years ago tonight, an opening night audience cheered the new Ziegfeld Folly starring W.C. Fields, Raymond Hitchcock, Van and Skink and Mary Eaton. But one of the highlights of the show, the moment that electrified the audience, was a singer and a song. As the curtain rose, the audience saw a shabbily dressed girl leaning against the lamppost in the Montmartre section of Paris. And a newcomer to the ranks of the great Ziegfeld stars, Fanny Bryce, made her bid for fame with a never-to-be-forgotten song, My Man. me a lot but there's one thing that I've got it's my man cold and wet tired you bet but all that I soon forget with my man He's not much for looks and no hero out of books. Here's my man. Two or three girls has he that he likes as well as me, but I love him. I don't know why I should. He isn't good. He isn't true. He beats me too. What can I do?
God. I love him so. He'll never know. All my life is just despair. But I don't care. When he takes me in his arms, the world is bright. All right. And what's the difference if I say I'll go away when I know I'll come back on my knees someday for whatever my man Since that eventful night in 1921, Fanny Bryce has remained a star. Tonight we find her idolized by millions of radio listeners in her favorite characterization of that impossibly lovable brat, Baby Snooks. Well, we pick up Snooks and Daddy, played by Hanley Stafford, where we left them last week. This rapidly bids fair to become the longest night in Daddy's life. It started at midnight when he returned from the country without his door key. After breaking in the house and wrangling with Snooks for several hours, they are both finally sleeping peacefully. Listen. Man's got to have insurance. Fifty broken arms. I want some ice cream. Daddy! Uh, huh? Daddy, wake up. Oh, what's the matter? I'm not sleeping. Well, go to sleep. I don't want it. Why not? Because I want some ice cream. Oh, ice cream again. Snooks, won't you give me a little piece? A piece of ice cream? No. I want rest. Why? I've told you a million times. The insurance doctor will be here soon, and I haven't closed my eyes all night. Why? Because you won't let me sleep. You've had me up 40 times on flimsy excuses. First, the faucet was dripping. Then the shade was flapping. And then, then the blanket slipped, and I had a cold. Oh, boat. keep quiet. <laughs> now you go right back to sleep this instant. Let me have a couple of hours rest. Otherwise, I'll be completely run down. Run down and get me some light. <laughs> no! Now go to sleep. All right. Good night. Good night. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I don't know. Oh, I'm going to join the army and get some peace. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Go to sleep. All right. Daddy. What is it? If I go to sleep, will you buy me a rabbit? Yes. What kind of a rabbit? Any kind. A white rabbit? Yes. I don't like white rabbits. Well, I'll buy any kind of rabbit you like. Just let me sleep. I want a rabbit that barks. Rabbits don't bark. My teacher says they do. Well, your teacher's crazy. Rabbits don't bark. She said that rabbits eat cabbage and leaves and bark. Oh, that's a different kind of bark. She meant the bark of a tree. Does trees bark too? No, only dogs bark. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Will you go to sleep? Mom, tell me a story. Snooks, do you realize it's almost five o'clock in the morning? And if I don't pass that insurance examination, I'll give you the licking of your life. What's the insurance, Daddy? How many times must I tell you? It's something I pay for so you can live comfortably when I'm gone. Where are you going? I'm not going anywhere. Why? <laughs> because I'm not. I just want to be fit in the morning so I can get this double indemnity policy. What a double indemnity <laughs> Well, I certainly stuck my neck out there. <laughs> Double indemnity means if I die a natural death, I get $10,000. Oh, 
If I commit suicide, I get 20. Right now, that seems like a pleasant way of making $20,000. Do it, Daddy. I will not. Now go to sleep. Come on, tell me your story. No! If you don't, I'll make a hole in my mattress and I'll eat all the stuff. No, please. Come on, tell me your story. All right. Have you heard the story of the three old men? No. He, he, he. Good night. Good night. <laughs> I'm going to put the light on. I'll turn that light off. I don't want it. Well, I'll just unscrew the bulb. There. Now you won't be able to put the light on at all. Good night. Good night, Daddy. Daddy. Oh, what is it? I hear a noise. Oh, it's your imagination. Now go to sleep. I think there's a burglar in the kitchen, Daddy. Now what would a burglar be doing in the kitchen? Maybe he'd want to eat the pie that Mommy made. Well, it'll serve him right. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> I heard the noise again, Daddy. Oh, listen, Snooks. If you heard a noise, it can't be a burglar. Because if a burglar came in here, he wouldn't make any noise at all. Now, please go to sleep. All right. He's here now, Daddy. Why do you say that? Because well, I didn't hear no noise. <laughs> Will you stop all this burglar stuff? You're giving me the creeps. Besides, I, I'm with you, so there's nothing to be afraid of. I ain't afraid I like it. <laughs> well, don't mention it anymore. Now, good night. Good night, Daddy. Oh, oh. Uh, 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 nothing. <laughs> good night. Awful dark in here. Good thing I'm not scared of birds. <laughs> oh! No. Is that you? Mm-hmm. Oh. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you were safe. And if, uh, if anything does happen, uh, just keep cool. <laughs> You're cool, ain't you, Daddy? Right, go to sleep. Oh. Snooks, cut that out. Stop walking around. Snooks, get back in bed, you hear me? Get back in bed. I am in bed, Daddy. Then, oh! Quick, turn on the light. There ain't no bulb. Hey, hey, it's on the night table. Who, who's in this room? Come, come out, you. Oh, you got me. <laughs> you horrible child. Your poor father's shot and you're laughing. You ain't shot, Daddy. I threw the bulb on the floor. <laughs> so, what am I going to do with you? You're making a nervous wreck out of me. I know I'll never get that insurance. What's insurance, Daddy? That's the last straw. Now I'm going to spank you. Now say your prayers and go right to sleep. And not another sound out of you. Go on, say your prayers. <laughs> All right. Bless Mommy and the baby and Uncle Louie and Mrs. Fletch and my teacher and the cat and, and the burglar and Aunt Sophie. Amen. Have you finished? Yeah. I suppose you noticed... You wasn't in it. <laughs> ah, good night. Ah, good night. <laughs> Warren, there's a wonderful fragrance of freshly made coffee in the air that tells me it's time right now for that familiar Thursday evening custom of ours. You're right, Bob. Time right now for a moment of relaxation over a steaming, fragrant cup of the new Maxwell House coffee. And friends, as always, we're inviting all of you everywhere to join us in this friendly custom in your own homes. We think you'll enjoy this show of ours still more over a cup of the coffee that's good to the last drop. Now, Warren, if you'll do the honors, I'll give the nod to Meredith and he'll pour out the music. We pause briefly for station identification. This is KFI, Los Angeles. We continue the Maxwell House Good News program. Tonight, the MGM Theater of the Air is proud to present our famous comedian, Mr. Frank Morgan, 
in a serious drama. The lovers of the legitimate theater will recall Frank Morgan's early success on the Broadway stage, and we hope that his performance tonight with Miss Rita Johnson will be enjoyed by his Maxwell House friends. All names of characters used are fictitious. Meredith, may we have some curtain music, please? <laughs> The action takes place in one of the glamorous gaming casinos on the French Riviera. A fashionably dressed crowd has been following the changing fortunes of a beautiful girl whose daring play at the roulette has captured the admiration of all. After winning heavily, she has started to lose steadily. But as her losses mount, she coolly continues her play. Eight wins, and the beautiful blonde loses again. Well, that's a young fortune she's lost in the last half hour. But she's been a good sport about it, I'll say that for her. Probably so rich she doesn't need it. I wonder who she is. Uh-oh. Looks like she's had enough now. No more tips, thank you. That'll be all for this evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, monsieur. Uh, most attractive young woman, eh? I wonder who she is. Uh, perhaps the croupier would know. Pardon, monsieur. That young woman who just left here, who is she? I do not know, monsieur. She has been here the last three evenings, always alone. Thank you. Vigneault, I should like a word with that young woman. Do you mind? I certainly do. That wasn't in our agreement. Oh, come now. Be generous. You may follow me if you wish at a discreet distance. <clears throat> well, uh, all right, but uh, be discreet yourself. Oh, never fear. Mademoiselle, a moment, s'il vous plaît. Oui, monsieur. Mille pardon, mademoiselle. Je vous, je vous You'll en prie. You have to speak English if you have anything to say to me, or have you? I beg your pardon, mademoiselle. I felt absolutely sure mademoiselle was Parisian. What is it, please? I'm leaving immediately. Yes, well, this bag, mademoiselle, I saw you drop it as you left the table, so I took the liberty of... Oh, you might have saved yourself the trouble. You see, it's quite empty. Yes, but the bag No, itself... I never want to see it again. Keep it if you like. Give it to your wife. And I hope it brings her better luck than it did me. But, mademoiselle, it happens that, unfortunately, I do not possess a wife. No matter. I don't care what you do with it. Throw it into the Mediterranean. I'm sorry the gods didn't smile on you this evening. Still, one must accept what they send, the evil along with the good. Oh. Mademoiselle, you're ill. No. No, I... I'm all right. Well, let me take you into the air. A little walk, perhaps, along the cliff. Yeah. It'll do you good. The cliff? Y y yes, that's what I want, but I prefer to go alone, thank you. As you wish, Mademoiselle, of course. Au revoir. Au revoir. Ah, Vigno, there you are, my faithful shadow. You see, your fears as to my intentions were groundless. <laughs> well, she didn't waste very much time on you. <laughs> Must be losing your touch. Come on, let's go back to the table. No, 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 not yet, Vigno. I would like to continue the conversation with her outside. Mon Dieu, that's asking a little too much. Oh, come now, be a good fellow. Give me half hour to myself, just one half hour. I promise I won't compromise you, and you know I'm a man of my word. Mm. Just because of what happened 20 years ago in that dugout at Soissons, I act a sentimental fool tonight. <laughs> Go on, then, but remember your promise. Ah, uh, uh, good old Vigneault. Still faithful to his old lieutenant. Well, I'll see you in half an hour. Uh, one moment. What is it now, Vigneault? The lady has gone out this way. Why do you return to the gaming room? Well, I, uh, I have a premonition, a presentiment, Vigneault. But I won't be long. You'll have no regrets, old friend. A bientôt. Mademoiselle, oh. be careful. It's dangerous oh. on the edge of this cliff. In fact, all cliffs are dangerous. Let me go. You have no right to stop me. Well, perhaps not, but I can't permit such a no. charming girl to... Who are you? Oh... Oh, you're the gentleman who spoke to me at the casino. Yes, I had that honor, mademoiselle. Did you follow me here? Yes, mademoiselle. I saw the look in your eyes. I've seen that look before. I know what it means. Well, let me go. It's my own life. No, I... mademoiselle, forgive me. I shall be compelled to hold you fast until you're sane again. Oh. Overwrought nerves play strange tricks. You'll see things differently tomorrow. And there won't be any tomorrow for me. Oh, there'll be many tomorrows, mademoiselle, and happy ones. And how can you say that? You don't know anything about this. Well, I know something about life. I know that things can't be quite hopeless when one is so young and so beautiful. Why should you seek to destroy yourself for a few francs? Oh, it isn't only the loss of the money. It's the thought of what's ahead. 
humiliation. Disgrace. Yes, so tell me all about it, Mademoiselle. Come. Let me get you a glass of sherry and a sandwich. It's nothing like a little refreshment to buoy up the spirit. No. No, thanks. I couldn't. I, I wouldn't be seen in public looking like this. My eyes are all swollen and my nose shining like a lamppost. <laughs> well, now, that's much better. As soon as the lady begins to think of her powder puff, the crisis has passed. Well, I don't... <laughs> I don't know why I should unload my troubles on you. No, 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 my dear. My shoulders are broad. I take it that you support yourself in business? Uh, secretary, perhaps? No, no, I'm a fashion model. That explains this costume and my troubles. No. You see, for so long I wore fine clothes, jewels, furs for fashionable, spoiled women who treated me as if I were wax. I envied them. I hated them. Yes, I quite understand. So I saved for months until I had enough money to give myself a taste of life daily. And you didn't find it so delectable as you'd imagined? On the contrary, I loved every minute of it. You know, I, I hoped that I'd meet some rich man here on the Riviera who would fall in love with me, marry me, and I could have things the way I'd always wanted them. Yeah, well, that happens, I'm afraid, only in the make-believe. Things would have been all right if I hadn't started to gamble. The rest I simply couldn't lose. And my luck changed. I began losing steadily. Hmm. I was desperate. I had to do something. Yes, and so you forged. How did you know? Well, one such step naturally leads to the next. Yes, I forged my employer's name on a check. They gave me the money without a question. You know the rest. It's not a news story, mademoiselle. Well, now you see why I can't go home. I can't pay them back. There's nothing I can do. But one mistake need not necessarily mean disaster. Surely there must be some way out. I wish with all my heart that I might be of assistance, mademoiselle. But unfortunately, I'm leaving France in just a few hours. Uh, leaving France? You, you mean forever? Well, for a long, long time, that's certain. Oh, if I could only get away from this place, it would be my salvation. Uh, where are you going? To a far distant colony, to the other end of the earth. Then if you really want to help me, take me with you. My child, that's utterly impossible. Well, I don't see why. I wouldn't be a bit of trouble. I'm very clever, really. I can cook and sew. Mademoiselle, the idea is fantastic. You don't even know my name. I don't care. I know that you're kind and sympathetic. You told me you weren't married. I'd make a good wife to you. A wife? Well, that's an intriguing thought. But the place where I'm going isn't very pleasant. There's heat and sometimes pestilence, no comforts, no conveniences. I can stand it if you can. But I'm going only because my business had made it necessary. But you, my dear, you'd die of loneliness. Not if you were there. Really? You know, that's the nicest thing anyone has said to me in years. No, but it's impossible. You'll go back to England, back to your modeling, and someday you'll marry a fine English boy. I can't go back. I haven't any money. But I'll let you have some money. Oh, I, I couldn't take it from you, a perfect stranger. A moment ago, you were ready to marry me. Oh, that was different. I... Perhaps to an English woman. Now, uh, tell me, how much do you need? I'm ashamed to tell you. It would take 6,000 francs. Yes, well, that's not so much. I have quite a bit of currency with me. Suppose I let you have 10,000 francs. 10,000? Oh, 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 no, I, I couldn't take it. Oh, don't be foolish. You're a businesswoman. It'll be a loan. You'd let me pay you back. Why not? See, here, here's my notebook. I'll make out an IOU, all right and proper. Now, and you'll sign. Will that satisfy you? Well, I... I well, no. sign. So, Miss Joan Weston. Believe me, I'll pay you back, and I can't tell you how grateful I am. Oh, it's nothing. Now, uh, well, uh, who who are you? To whom shall I send the money? Have you ever heard of Frederick Truel? Truel? The famous banker? Yes, you see, you needn't hesitate. 10,000 francs is so much confetti to Frederick Truel. They'll never serve a better purpose than tonight. Oh, how good you are. You know you've given me back my hope and self-respect. And if it weren't for you, I'd be down there at the bottom of that cliff. No, 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 don't think of that. Or if you do, think of it as a bad dream, a nightmare. Too much lobster and champagne, eh? I'll <laughs> try. Yes. There's, uh, there's one thing you must promise me. No more forging. Never. Mm -hmm. I don't see how I ever did such a thing. I must have been mad. You were, but now you're sane again. And you mustn't forget your lesson. Never. And now, my dear, I really must leave you. I have an important engagement. Au revoir.
and the best of luck. Could I kiss you goodbye? Well, certainly. That'll be something to cherish in the memory. Mademoiselle, your hand. I salute you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, Vignon, you were getting a little uneasy, eh? I told you I was a man of my word. That's what I thought until I heard what happened in the casino tonight. What was that? Of course, you're totally unaware that a certain gentleman was relieved of a large bankroll as he stood watching the roulette. Is it possible? And by a queer coincidence, during those few moments after you had returned to the table. Well, well, well. Uh, my compliments, Pierre Labos, on an extremely artistic piece of work. You flatter me. You promised me faithfully that if I gave you this half hour, you'd not get into mischief. Yes. Now, hand over the 10,000 francs you stole. Stole is an ugly word, my friend. Come across. Oh, if you refer to those few miserable francs I borrowed, I made good use of them. Uh, no doubt. That, uh, that girl you saw here a little while ago, the poor child was about to destroy herself. And you saved her, I suppose. Th those 10,000 francs saved her from death. Nevertheless, you broke your word and stole the money. I insist it was only borrowed. Here's the girl's IOU to prove it. Well, let's have it. Why? Why, this is payable to Frederick Toole, the man you robbed. Of course, after all, the money was his. It's only fair that he should have the IOU. The girl will never know the difference. You, you mean to say you had the effrontery to pass yourself off as the great, the irreproachable Frederick Toole? Why not? It was a worthy cause, and old Toole will never lose a sou. You give him the note, Vigneault. Tell him those 10,000 francs have done more good tonight than all the millions he ever spent on libraries. <laughs> <laughs> I've always said you're an artist. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pity you didn't devote your talents to the stage. Yes, but in that case, I should have spent my life making entertainment for others instead of enjoying myself. Ah, but the price, my dear Pierre, the price. Well, the price. One enjoys oneself and one pays. It's the law of life. Oh, a philosopher, too. <laughs> my word. <laughs> yes, laugh. It's your warped <laughs> sense of humor that betrays the policeman. Well, uh, what about the girl? She's going back home. Ah, truly very touching. And was she properly grateful? Well, I'll tell you how grateful, Vigneault. She begged to go along with me tomorrow. She wanted me to make her my wife. What? <laughs> she was willing to marry you? Is it inconceivable that a woman of intelligence and refinement could spend her life happily with me? <laughs> she wanted to go with you. <laughs> well, Yes. Well, did you tell her your destination? I said a business trip to a far distant colony. What? A colony? Oh, yes. my word, what an imagination. What an artist. And what a fancy name for Devil's Island. Frank Morgan and Rita Johnson, thank you for a swell job. The drama, A Man of His Word, was written by Blanche Firth and Elwood Ullman. And here's Meredith Wilson and his orchestra playing a new song from the Broadway hit Stars in Your Eyes. It's called Terribly Attractive. <laughs>
once again, Ed Sullivan and Water Under the Bridge. We've taken you into the past of the artists who appear on Good News regularly, and soon we'll tell you about others. But first, I'd like to tell you something interesting about the product that brings you this grand program and these fine people. You probably all know that Maxwell House coffee was first served in the old Maxwell House in Nashville, Tennessee, more than 50 years ago by that master of the art of coffee blending, Joel Cheek. But here's something that perhaps you never heard. The man who is credited with that coffee's famous slogan was a president of the United States. On a trip to Nashville at the climax of a dinner typical of fine old Southern hospitality, he proclaimed this Maxwell House coffee slogan, good to the last drop. How about it, Warren? Isn't that right? It is, Ed. And by the way, many people say that last drop is the best drop of all. Friends, since his time, millions of people have upheld that judgment until today, more people are buying Maxwell House than ever before in the history of this fine coffee. And we believe there's a very good reason. You see, down through the years, Maxwell House has done everything in its power to bring you the finest coffee possible at the lowest possible price. And today, the new Maxwell House is truly a finer coffee than ever before. Not only has the blend been further enriched, but also the new radiant roast process roasts each bean evenly all the way through. You have probably never tasted coffee with so much delicious, fragrant flavor. So if you haven't tried Maxwell House coffee lately, ask your grocer for a pound. You'll see at once how much more delicious, more satisfying coffee can be. Yes, all the family will say it's just grand. They'll agree that Maxwell House really is coffee good to the last drop. <laughs> Sullivan again with more water under the bridge. Nineteen twenty four, Washington, D.C. President Coolidge signs the income tax law. Churchill down. Black Gold wins the Kentucky Derby. New York. Georges Carpentier arrives on the Majestic to fight Tommy Gibbons of St. Paul on May thirty first. And at Lewison Stadium, Stadium in New York City, the attend a rehearsal of the New York Philharmonic under the direction of the famous Willem van Hoogstraten. It's a marvelous orchestra, all concert specialists. That is all but one new member. He's a young man from the American Middle West, and his only ex experience has been with Sousa's famous band. He is only 18 years old, and yet he's been engaged as first flute player with the Philharmonic. Perhaps you can all imagine his feelings now as he arrives for his first rehearsal. Uh, pardon me, but could you tell me where I'm supposed to sit? Uh, who are you? The uh, name is Wilson. I'm the new flute player. What? I'm the new flute player with the orchestra. Uh, where do I sit? With the flute players, of course. <laughs> I see. Uh, where's that? You're going to play first flute and you do not know where to sit? No, I've never even heard a symphony, but I'll catch on to it. <laughs> Quiet. There's one who's rotten now. Sit over there. Good morning, gentlemen. We'll begin our rehearsals with a Tchaikovsky Six, which, of course, you all know so well. Can you not work over it in any great detail? Uh, that is, I believe we are all familiar with it. Uh, now, uh, Mr. What's that new chap's name, Mr. Mr. W oh, yes, Wilson. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Yes, sir. Uh, you know the Tchaikovsky Six, do you not? Uh, no, sir. What? Uh, uh, Mr. Wilson, <laughs> possibly you have misunderstood me. I do not expect you have played the Sixth Symphony, but you have heard it, surely. Uh, no, sir. <laughs> <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen, please. Uh, Mr. Wilson, I hope you will enjoy it. <laughs> that was Meredith Wilson's beginning with the Philharmonic. He played his part so perfectly that night, however, that he received the congratulations of Von Hoogstraten, who only that morning had been amazed at the apparent ignorance of his new musician. Water under the bridge. Meredith Wilson plays for us now in his MGM concert hall, 
his first symphonic composition, which was given its world premiere with the Philharmonic by that same Willem von Hoogstraten only three years later. The title of Meredith's composition is Parade Fantastique. Next week, another all-star program. Special guest stars, plus the regular Good News gang, Fanny Bryce, Hanley Stafford, Frank Morgan, and Connie Bodwell. See you next Thursday, then. And in the meantime, this is what Ed Sullivan says about MGM's new picture, Goodbye, Mr. Chip, which opens at the Astor Theater in New York City and the Four Star Theater in Los Angeles, May 15th. Come on in, Ed, and tell him. Well, Bob, you can bet the family jewels that Goodbye, Mr. Chip will come awfully close to winning that Academy Award for 1939. Good night. Good night, Ed, and thank you. This is Bob Young saying good night. Good night.
night and good luck for the makers of Maxwell House, the coffee that's always good to the last drop. Underneath the spreading chestnut tree, I love her and she.